Hello, welcome everybody to ECCV. Um, my name is Matthias Niesner and I will talk today about learning non-rigid tracking. Um, of course, many of you know how to do 3D reconstruction and one of the very seminal work for non-rigid reconstruction um, was the dynamic fusion paper by Richard Newcomb. And the idea of this line of work is that rather than focusing on a, on a specific template, like a human body, a hand, or a face, um, you actually want to um, reconstruct um, arbitrary shapes, arbitrary objects that are non-rigidly moving. And the idea of these methods is you have an RGBD camera in this case, you have here an RGB input, you have um, a depth input, um, like a Kinect, a structure sensor, and so on. And the idea is that in these methods, um, you essentially, over time, you're accumulating this data and you jointly doing non-rigid tracking while accumulating everything into a warped model. Um, and as a result, if you're running these methods, you get something like this. Um, so you have a sequence here, right? And now you're recording the sequence here. Um, this is now the warped model of this reconstruction in the current frame. And as a canonical reconstruction, you get something like this. So this was 2015. Um, this, this work has actually inspired a lot of follow-up work. Um, but at the same time, it is still a very difficult problem statement. And one of the main reasons why this is so difficult is when you're doing non rigid reconstruction, you never know when something moves or whether this is just a new correspondence you need to find. So like many problems in computer vision, this essentially maps down to correspondence finding. So if I know where every point moves, um, or how every point changes, right? Um, then I would know essentially a lot more and I could um, use this in a data term and do the reconstruction. So one of the core fundamental challenges I would like to talk about today is in these kind of frameworks, um, how do we actually learn to find these correspondences? This is the first step I wanna talk about. The second step is I wanna talk about once we have correspondences, how do we select the good ones? And third, I would like to talk about um, how can we differentiate through the optimization process and what does that mean? Now, the correspondences, as I said, is one of the key elements here. Um, so for instance, we have a sequence like this. Here we have a top-down view of a backpack. We have here a key point here. Uh, and we would like to know where this source key point appeared in this target image, because this is basically in these non rigid reconstruction frameworks. Um, this will give us um, yeah, the correspondences in the data term. Now in this case, right, like we have this backpack and as a human, I would probably know that this is the back of this backpack. So I know that somewhere here, I'm gonna have this correspondence. Um, and traditionally speaking in um, a lot of this non-rigid reconstruction work, um, people have still used handcrafted correspondences. Um, we've seen a lot of direct approaches like dense ICP terms, dense RGB terms, but surprisingly little um, learned methods have been appeared. And this is one of the first works actually that was actually just published from our group um, by Alex Bocic um, et al. Uh, in CVPR20. Um, how do we learn these correspondences? And the network architecture is actually relatively easy to, to set up. So what you can do is you can say, oh, we have a source RGBD frame, right? We have a target RGBD frame. Um, and what we're doing is um, we simply have an encoder uh, uh, a shared encoder for both of these RGBD frames. We have a bottleneck layer. Um, we're gonna have a decoder. And what we want to do is, you see this little tiny red point here? Um, for this little tiny red point, we want to predict where's this point in the respective targets. This is our problem statement for the correspondence finding for non rigid problems. Um, in this case, what we do is we, uh, yeah, we simply have a, a binary cross entropy loss here. Um, and this binary cross entropy tells us, um, well, for every point, is it that point, right? And at the same time, <clears throat> we have a softmax loss that, that tells us it forces that only one of these predictions is actually going to be the right one. And um, so this goes over all the pixels here in this case. And the idea is now, again, this point is always in the center, so we don't have to add an additional input. We just know that it's always the center. And now what we want to do is over this target domain, we want to figure out where could this uh, this point be. So in this case here, we have the red point, right? Which is, you know, would likely correspond to this region. Um, and then we have kind of a, a smooth probability distribution that we're predicting here um, where this correspondence could go. And again, we have these two losses. One of them is a 
per pixel binary cross entropy loss, and the other one goes over all pixels um, in a softmax fashion. So we can force the, um, the total prediction sum up to one in this case. Okay, um, so this is in principle relatively easy to train. There's of course a lot of tricks on the architecture, right? We have here skip connections um, because we want to uh, also forward the low fidelity features. Um, what turns out the softmax loss is, is key to making this work because this, this, this forces the network to make um, dependent predictions across all pixels and not just independent pixel, uh, predictions um, on a per pixel level. Um, we also have a few more tricks here. We also have a visibility detection. So we want to figure out um, for every pixel uh, in, the, uh, in the target here, was it actually visible? Um, and so on a per pixel basis here, we're also classifying um, whether these pixels are visible. And this actually, these proxy losses, they help us a lot because the, this way we can help the network um, to, to get some um, yeah, understanding of the higher level structures here. Now, if you're training a network like this, you're going to get a result that look like this. All right, so here we have um, five points in the reference. Again, the network respectively would see like this patch here as input. It would center it around this key point. Um, and then we would get the respective target predictions. So in this case, for these five points, we would run this network five times. And we would get predictions that look something like these ones here, right? So you see this blue point here on the hand is kind of being respectively predicted on the hand. The green point here is on this hand and so on. Um, and the nice thing is, of course, we are making no assumptions right now about the, you know, any structure, any specific motion or whatsoever. This is a very generic uh, non nutrient deformation framework. Um, yeah, we can do this also for relatively fast motion. In this case, we have this shirt here. Um, again, this is just for a couple of representative points. Um, if you're running this then in a, in a non-rigid reconstruction framework, um, you can actually go ahead uh, and run this for many, many points, as many as you need in order to get enough uh, data points for the data term uh, in order to over-constrain your problem. Now, this is just the correspondence, right? Um, of course, what we would love to get at the end of the day is a 3D reconstruction of everything. So now we combine all of these things together with traditional insights from 3D reconstruction method. And this is what this deep deformed method is doing then. Um, so in principle, what you have is you have a canonical shape. Um, you have a current depth map here. You want to align the canonical shape with a dense ICP term to the current depth. This is essentially what dynamic fusion is, has been doing before. Um, but th since this only converges when you're relatively close and when you have not so much motion, um, this doesn't work so well in many cases, and we'll show this in a second. Um, but now we're adding our learned correspondences and what we're doing in practice. We have, you see here this animation, right? You see this point here is being um, kind of swiped um, throughout the image. So we, we're running this a couple of times. And if I run this here again, right, you see that this like point is being queried and where it is in the respective targets. We have the CNN I just proposed. Um, and now we're combining these two terms, the traditional depth ICP term um, with our learned non rigid correspondence term. And, and now we're combining this um, in this non rigid construction framework, and then we're getting our respective work model. Um, and at the end of the day, we um, can do similar things what the previous methods has been doing for um, non rigid reconstruction, except now we have these, these learned correspondences here, right? Um, yeah, so in practice, it looks like that. Here we have um, we have an input RGBD sequence, right? We have here our warp model with respect to the current frame. Uh, and here's our canonical pose, meaning that, for instance, when he's turning around here, we would also get geometry on the back here of the person. Um, if you're combining this with the, um, yeah, the previous state of the art dynamic fusion, um, we can see that especially for things like hands, you know, like dynamic fusion fails because the depth correspondences are often not enough. Um, and we get actually pretty robust tracking now because we have these learned correspondences. Um, and this is not just a visual issue. This is also something we can quantitatively evaluate. Um, so what we're doing here um, is we have dynamic fusion. This is our re-implementation. Um, we actually compare it against the original sequences and we would argue we are actually even a bit better than the original version. Um, so this is already a pretty robust implementation. It's not so straightforward to get this to run. Uh, took us quite a while. Um, if we're evaluating this on, on our sequences, um, we're getting a deformation error that is basically telling us how good is the knowledge tracking of about six centimeters. Um, it means for some sequences it fails. Geometric error in the reconstruction is about one centimeter on average, the error. 
Um, if you're taking volume deform, this is the author's implementation. That one actually is not so good of an implementation in this case because it performs a little bit worse. Um, we also try to combine dynamic fusion with 3D match. This is basically previous state of the art for um, keep on based matching. Um, that actually didn't help too much. And there's a reason why this doesn't help too much because if you're doing it key point based, it is also tricky to find consistent key points. So um, there's a bit of insight why a standard key point matcher um, also with SIFT or so doesn't work so well in these cases. So volume deform uses SIFT, so sometimes that has some issues. Um, but our method is much better actually. Um, and the reason is because we, we're just using um, tailored learned features for this specific task. So that's not a big surprise. Um, I would also say the network is relatively straightforward, um, but there's one important detail that I haven't talked about right now. And one of them is actually on this slide is, oh, how do we actually get these numbers? So obviously we need to have some ground truth data um, for both training and for, for evaluation. And these numbers here are also on our new data set that we introduced. And this is this kind of this minor detail that I, I didn't talk about yet is how do we actually train that? Mm. In this case, what we're doing is we, um, we capture a data set because there hasn't been a large scale data set for training. So we wanted to enable this. Um, we're taking a structure sensor here um, that's basically a Kinect. Uh, it's occipital manufactures these. Um, they have an open AI, open AI, uh, open NI, <laughs> uh, API here. Um, and um, we have the color from the iPad and the depth from the structure sensor. Um, so we record um, a bunch of sequences. Um, and then what we do is we um, annotate a segmentation. So in this case, we have a user interface where an annotator goes ahead, right, and, and marks um, the object of interest that we want to non rigidly reconstruct here and adds a label. In this case, we add an adult label. Um, once we have that one, um, now we want to figure out correspondence annotations over time. So in this case, we do sparse correspondence annotations. Um, in this case here, we have two frames. And for these two frames, we simply show the two images side by side. And as you see, the user here clicks um, to get the sparse correspondences annotated. So I'm going to show this again here. Um, yeah, right here. So right, so we have one correspondence, two, three, four, and so on. Um, and this is actually a relatively fast process. Um, but then we also want to verify that these sparse annotations are good. Um, and the way we do this is we essentially run um, as rigid as possible um, alignment based on these ground truth annotated correspondences. So we run this ROC tracker um, to get some dense alignment. And this is actually run them in the browser. So we can see this live. Um, the annotator sees this live if there's enough correspondences being set and also if the correspondences are good. Um, in practice, this looks like this then. Um, so here we, we then basically, we see whether the annotations are correct because if the final has been if the final model has been correctly aligned, um, then this broke up. Um, and yeah, and with this dense alignment, we also get, of course, not just the verification for the user that the sparse correspondences were good. We also have a lot of dense correspondences because we can just sample um, the non rigidly tracked model here with these ground truth correspondences. Now, in total, we actually captured a lot of different sequences. So um, a lot of them are actually humans, um, but a lot of them are also cloth you know, some blankets, pillows, um, clothing generally speaking that the human is holding, um, and so on. So we have a couple of, of, of different um, varieties here. Um, in total, we recorded roughly 400 sequences. Um, it's almost 400,000 RGBD frames. Um, we have in total about 5,500 dense alignments between frame pairs. Um, we have about 4.4K annotated object mask, we have 150k sparse matches being annotated, and we also annotated occlusion points. This is something actually, if you have in this proxy loss that I described before, um, that actually helps a lot in order to get the performance to be better. We now very recently um, put a, a benchmark online um, based on this data. So we split the sequences, in total we have 400 sequences, right? So we split them up into 340 frame sequences, 300, uh, 30 validation and 30 tests. Um, and um, this benchmark is live um, on the GitHub side. Um, we are evaluating both uh, geometric error and deformation error. And on the benchmark right now, we have uh, yeah we have this leaderboard already, so you can basically upload your method. You can directly see how well your non rigid reconstruction and non rigid tracking method does actually. Uh, we also have an optical flow evaluation. Um, this is not the main intent here. 
But of course, we can also abuse the, the 3D proxy data um, to get real world uh, flow data. Um, I mean, there's a bit of a question in terms of you know how how accurate is everything. Um, um, we can say it's 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 definitely pretty accurate. Um, but the interesting thing is for flow, for instance, for non rigid scene flow or stuff like this, there's actually not so much um, real world data available where you have ground truth annotated correspondences. And this is something I feel um, it might be also interesting for that kind of community. Now, the lessons learned so far um, is. We can learn non rigid correspondences. I mean, that's not a big surprise, but it's what deep learning has been doing for quite a while now. Um, we also, um, of course, solved the difficult task right now of providing the data. Um, I would say the network is probably improvable that we have, but I think the data is actually here the main contribution um, because that is very difficult to obtain, right? In this case, we hired a lot of people. We had sometimes up to 10 student helpers um, working, and working hours um, to give us these annotations. Um, both for the segmentation masks, but also for the non rigid correspondences. So that one, I think, is, is, is a pretty good basis now. We have a benchmark, right? We have data. We have um, a good baseline already for learning the correspondences. I think even the, the results are pretty good because, you know, we outperform everything that was prior to deep learning, of course. Um, but there's a few interesting things that we haven't done yet. And one interesting thing that I always felt is, well, why... Why are we actually doing correspondence prediction first, and then we have a second process that does the reconstruction and the tracking? So the basic thing here right now is the non-rigid result that we're getting at the very end of the day, either not tracking or non-rigid reconstruction, is actually not informing the feature matching. This is one, one big issue. Right? Ideally, I would like to make a feature selection or a correspondence selection um, based on my final output. Right? If I tracked and reconstructed my non rigid object correctly, then I found probably good correspondences. Um, how to deal with outliers? These are kind of questions that we haven't really addressed here. And most of the time, like outlier prediction and stuff like this is still handcrafted in this framework. So this is still a big issue. So what I'm kind of envisioning here is um, it would be really great if we could do all of this end-to-end, -end, right? If basically, oh, I reconstructed this well because I reconstructed this and that, I needed to get these kind of correspondences for instance. So this is something we don't have right now. Um, another problem is it's relatively slow actually, because for every single correspondence in this current architecture, we have to run the network, right? Um, and this is a problem if you need like, let's say you need 100 correspondences, right? You have 100 forward passes at test time per frame. Um, and that's actually quite something that makes it relatively slow. I mean, it's not like hours or minutes, it's, but it's, it's, it's not necessarily real time capable. Um, this is something we would still like to do um, when you're talking about non-rigid real-time reconstruction, right? Um, so one project, and that was also a CDPR paper from uh, Yang Li and colleagues, um, is actually going a little bit further on the optimization side. So the question is, well, we've learned correspondences now. Can we actually also do something? Can we learn how the optimization process possibly works? Um, and we have a similar setting in this case. We have a, a source RGBD frame. We have a target RGBD frame. And what we would like to do again is we would like to do the non-rigid alignment between these two, right? So similar setting as before. Um, in this case, to simplify the problem a little bit, we don't have a complicated non-rigid reconstruction framework. So it, it's, it's a little bit simplified because here we're just considering the, the two-frame case. Um, but I, I hope this is something um, that is actually enough um, to convince you that there are some cool ideas um, on the optimization side. So the idea what you can do is rather than learning explicit you know, point-based correspondences, you can go ahead um, and do a feature extraction. Um, so we have a source frame here, we have a target frame, we have an encoder respectively that gives us non-rigid features. And in order to learn these, what you can do is you can essentially um, put these features into an energy formulation that basically runs a bunch of course Newton steps uh, and tries to align this graph from the source with the, with the, with the target we have a loss on the graph nodes uh, and back propagate through this whole thing. So the idea here is that because we have a differentiable solver, we can get gradients throughout the solver in order to learn these features. So we have a learned data term. Um, we call this the feature fitting because in this case, we don't have um, explicit correspondences where you know we learned like from one point to another point, um, whether it's a match or not, or whether we have a heat map here. But instead here, we're learning a feature descriptor, then we then 
feed into a Gauss-Newton framework and um, we can differentiate through the Gauss-Newton framework um, in order to get gradients to get good correspondences. Um, but there's even a little bit more we can do here and that one I think I found pretty interesting. We can also learn how to speed up the Gauss-Newton process um, by for instance learning preconditioners in these matrices. So I wanted to go a little bit more into details here. So first of all, um, what we want to do here is differentiable non rigid optimization, right? So we have a we have a, a, a we have a data term, we have a regularization term. Um, in this case, our loss that we have here at the very end of the day is a deformation loss. So basically, for every point um, in this, uh, in uh, every deformed point um, should be at the respective target position based on the ground truth data. And the interesting thing here is actually in this Gauss Newton step here. Um, so eventually in this Gauss-Newton step, what we have to do is uh, we have to solve a linear system, right? Um, so we basically have to solve for this delta G here. This is my current graph update. Um, JTJ, you know, times delta. Delta here is my X. Um, and this is my residual term. Um, and a lot of people in this community, they're using all kinds of linear solver. But a very common solver is actually um, preconditioned conjugate gradient descent. So the PCG solver here, um, it's, it's a linear solver, right? So we have here Ax equal to b. And the idea here is um, that we can, we could even implement this on a GPU, right? We can implement this in a, in a, in a deep learning framework um, because we have um, automatic differentiation. Um, but the practical thing about PCG, this is just copied from Wikipedia basically, um, is that we have a bunch of functions that we need to evaluate. We have here eval JTF um, and we initialize the PCG. Um, and then here we have um, uh, eval JTJ. That's basically when, whenever we do an iteration here. Um, and these are the application-specific routines. Um, we have had a couple of previous works. And um, this is actually uh, uh, from a paper we called Opt. Um, in Opt, we we have a non-rigid, and sorry, a non-linear, uh, non-linear optimization framework um, where we can essentially use a compiler to efficiently compute these routines. Um, at compile time, and, and then we can get very, very quick performance. But the interesting thing here is um, the PCG is very much depending on the P, on the preconditioner. Um, so instead of solving AX is equal to B, um, what you're practically solving is actually M inverse times AX is equal to M inverse times B. So the idea of the preconditioning is that we have possibly an ill-shaped energy landscape or a not so well-behaved energy landscape, um, and we're, we're, we're reshaping it, right? So we're preconditioning it such that we have a better conditioning on the whole problem state. Um, and that's kind of the high level idea here. Um, and in the literature, not just for non rigid alignment problems, but generally speaking, um, there has been a lot of work in what preconditioner do you use here? And this is generic to any, non, to any linear system, right? Um, how do you precondition it? Um, there's of course pneumatic reasons, right? But then there's also various convergence reasons. Um, and the interesting thing is there's a lot of theory behind it. Um, and very common theories behind it is you can use an uh, incomplete Cholesky factorization, right? You can use a Jacobi preconditioner, could be block diagonal, could be also only diagonal. And the easiest way, what I said, is the Jacobi one where you just divide by, by the diagonal um, respectively. And this is a very common thing. Um, that, that people have been using here. Now, in our specific case, actually this choice makes a huge difference in terms of how well the stuff converges. Um, I was talking before about um, the dynamic fusion paper and um, the dynamic fusion paper, in my opinion, this worked also so well um, because Richard Newcomb at this point when he did this paper, he really understood how the solvers work. Like he knew, oh, when do we have to refactor? When do we have to recompute the deformation graph and stuff like this? Uh, and what preconditions do you have to use in order to um, get fast conversion speed? And the idea here is, because this is so tricky to figure out which preconditioner to use, maybe we can learn the preconditioner. And because of this, we, we propose a neural network to do that for us, um, because, you know, we, we don't want to think about it, we just want to learn it, basically. Um, and in this case, we, we call this condition net, so we want to learn the preconditioner. Um, and the idea is, right, we have essentially a PCG layer. This is our solver layer. Uh, we have a matrix M inverse, um, but the problem is um, this preconditioner 
um, should actually be a symmetric matrix. And because of that, we actually um, computing the lower bound matrix here first. So we have L times L transpose. Um, this gives us the right uh, matrix that we want, um, the matrix structure. And what we do here is we essentially feeding A in. We feeding this in this condition net. Um, we, com we, we, we make L is our prediction. Then we hard compute this multiplication of L times LT. Um, and then we feed it through our differentiable PCG layer, and then we're getting some result of our linear system. And the way we're training it basically is saying, oh, we do have the ground truth, right? So we can run an infinite number of uh, solve iterations, so we know what the lowest energy should be. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize um, this loss here. And this is what we call a preconditional loss, because we just differentiate now through, through this whole process. Um, and we want to make sure that we as close to the ground truth here um, that we can be. Um, and now we have a couple of interesting variations here. So now the variations is basically how many variables of this matrix are we predicting. We have a dense, a sparse, and a diagonal matrix here. And these choices actually um, are quite interesting because they tell you a lot of, uh, about the convergence. Um, and this is actually one of our main results here of this, of this uh, method. Um, here we have the number of PCG steps that we need to run. And here we have our residuals. Um, so they go from like 10 to the power of minus 1 until 10 to the power of minus 7. Um, I and mean, of course, this is all normalized. So, you know, it, it, that doesn't mean so much. But basically, you want to get here, you want to get lower, and you want to get as low as possible after as few iterations as possible. And yeah, the idea here is now, um, here are handcrafted preconditioners. Um, like incomplete Cholesky, block diagonal, and without the preconditioner. So without the preconditioner, we have the slowest, meaning we need the most PCG iterations. Um, block diagonal is a bit better. Incomplete Cholesky is again a bit better. But incomplete Cholesky is actually quite expensive to compute. So you, you're making a trade-off, like how expensive is every iteration versus how many iterations do you need. Um, and then you see our results of our condition net variance. Um, and our condition net dense is the, is the fastest version. It needs basically... Um, well, like a fourth or so, or a third or so of the handcrafted solvers and around half of the other variations that we had. So we're saving actually a significant amount of compute here by running a network that tells us good preconditioner, um, a test time, uh, in order to speed up the optimization by a significant amount. And this is kind of interesting. I mean, yes, here we are very interested about our non-tracking, non alignment, but this is a trick you can basically apply to any optimization problem. Of course, this is domain specific, right? This network is being trained on this domain of non tracking, right? Because of that, we know what is the right preconditioner for this class of problems. Um, but the principal idea is as soon as, as long as you have some data, you can probably apply this to other problem statements too. And I think that's, in my opinion, that's quite exciting. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is actually, now we're getting some results, and we're comparing against the infusion again, we are faster. Um, this is not the full reconstruction, to be fair, this is only aligning two frames. Um, we're taking the, the same implementation we had before, um, but we're converging faster and more often, so the basin of conversion gets better, as well as the conversion speed. Um, we have a few more examples here, so here, for instance, the dynamic fusion didn't get the arm right, we got the arm right. Um, yeah, we have a few more where we're just faster. Here, dynamic fusion is not fully converged yet. I think this would have probably worked if you ran it for longer, um, but ours um, actually converges. So if you're summarizing so far, um, I'm actually pretty excited about this one because there's some really cool insights um, in terms of learning how the optimization works better. It's right, we have this conditioner versus the full inverse potentially. Do you want to predict, do you want to actually do you actually need an optimization or do you just predict the final result? We've tried that, it doesn't work so well. So knowing about a fixed function optimizer, which you can differentiate through, but then learning specific parts of the optimizer seem to be a good sweet spot between you know, learning priors in the optimization and so on. And this one I think is pretty cool. And I feel these kind of things could also be applied to other problems. Um, so this is something we've been, we are still working on. Um, and I expect to see much more results here because it A, it gives you much better results to begin with and also it speeds up optimization, generally speaking. So, you know, learning, learning how to optimize seems kind of a cool research area right now. Um, and yeah, it's only for, for this area, but I think this could be applied to many other areas too. So, so far, this one actually was only learning um, 
things to align two frames. This was actually also only on the 2D grid. This is a very specific toy problem in practice. So it's a subset of the problems of 3D reconstruction of non shit scenes. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's okay for us to give a good proof um, that this actually works. Um, but the next steps now is basically we want to not only look at the optimization process itself, but we also want to go um, a step backwards um, again and say, oh, hmm, how do we combine this with previously estimated correspondences? Um, how do we integrate this in a full reconstruction framework? How do we use a deformation graph? Um, and so on. One thing I'm particularly excited here about, because we can now differentiate through a solver, we can do things like learning good preconditioners. Um, we can do another thing, meaning that we can select good correspondences. Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like attention. It's like which correspondence helps you the most. Um, traditional computer vision, you could also explain this as kind of robust optimization. So traditionally speaking, you have some outliers in an optimization problem, right? Um, what you want to do then is you want to figure out what are the outliers and um, you want to learn basically a weight for each correspondence. You want to optimize for this weight, of course. Um, but now what we want to do is we would love to, we love to learn it because um, we can differentiate through our solver. Uh, and this is a project which we're calling uh, Neural Knowledge Tracking. Um, and yeah, I don't have I don't have too much time to go into all the details, but I would still like to uh, hopefully give the high level message um, in this talk. Um, so the setting is is again the generic reconstruction problem. So in this case, we have a source frame, we have a target frame, and we want to predict a lot of correspondences from the source to the target, right? So we have a lot of correspondences here, um, but we don't just want to predict correspondences, we also want to learn a weight for these correspondences. So we have here these red correspondences, they have a lower weight because they might not be so good, right? This correspondence goes to the background, and you have green correspondences that are much more important. Um, and now the problem you're going to have in practice, you don't know how good these correspondences are because nobody has annotated for this specific soul uh, which correspondences that made the most impact in the optimization later on, right? You just it just nobody can go through by hand through the solver and check, oh yeah, this was an important correspondence, this was a smaller one. So traditionally speaking, people have used robust optimization techniques for that. Um, and we're trying to do a similar thing, except that we want to learn this correspondence weight. And so we basically want to predict a, a, a weight here. Um, then we do the optimization, right? We have a data term, we have a regularization term. Data term is essentially these correspondences. Regularization term is um, could be ARAP, could be embedded deformation. Um, in this case, we use an ARAP term um, on a deformation graph. Um, and then we have a loss that tells us, oh, between the prediction and our ground truth, how close were we at the end of the day? And the interesting thing is now, how do we get these correspondences right? A, we want to get good correspondences overall, right? And B, we want to figure out a good selection process, which correspondences are most important. Uh, and the way we do this is with this differentiable solver that essentially gets us gradient here from our final reconstruction back to the correspondences which were important. So all the learnable weights are here, um, but the gradients flow throughout this entire uh, optimization process. And this is now leveraging this differentiable solver here in order to figure out good weights um, for both correspondences as well as their weights. Uh, in practicing the implementation, it looks a little bit more complicated even. So this is the whole pipeline, basically. Um, so what we have is we have here an input RGBD frame. We have an input uh, target RGBD frame. Um, we have correspondence predictions. And we have a loss here for the correspondence predictions. Um, now we have this Psi here. And Psi is baiting every correspondence. So in addition to the correspondence itself, this network here predicts a weight for each correspondence. And what we're doing is we're simply multiplying each correspondence. This is this weight here. Um, we're feeding this one into the solver. We're feeding the correspondence itself into the solver. We're getting the reconstruction. Um, we have two losses here. One is a warp loss, one is a graph loss. I'm not going to go into all the details, but basically this one tells us oh, how good is the final reconstruction um, and how good is the final knowledge tracking here. Um, and based on that, we're getting now gradients that flow back here to the correspondence weighting part of the network, as well as to the correspondence prediction graph. Um, we also have a smart way of sampling the deformation graph here, but again, this is more like a detail. I think the interesting contribution is that we're basically figuring out how to get these correspondence uh, weights estimated jointly with the correspondences itself. And the nice thing is, here for the weights, we can do this in a self-supervised way now, because this is directly multiplied. We're running this whole optimization through the solver, 
um, in a, we can get this correspondence value in a self-supervised way. So I want to show some results. Uh, first, I want to, want to show some, some qualitative results. This is on the deep deformed data here. Um, and we have a lot of ablations here. Um, so here, um, this one is the just using the correspondence loss. If you're doing this, you're getting an endpoint error. This is an endpoint 3D error. This is basically how good is the reconstruction. And this one is how good is every node. Sorry, this is how good are the correspondences. And yeah, and this one is basically uh, telling you how good, um, how well does every graph deform at the end of the day. Okay. Um, yeah, so here we're getting um, the correspondence alone, give us uh, 42 millimeters for this endpoint end error, we're getting um, 67 millimeters for uh, the graph error. Uh, now, if we are differentiating through the whole solver without any correspondence selection, this is just saying, oh, we have a graph loss, we're differentiating through a solver in order to get better correspondences selected. That gets this down a little bit from, this one is more interesting probably, so the final deformation graph alignment error goes from 67 to 57. And this warping error that we introduced, this helps a little bit more. It gets from 57 to 54. But basically, rather than treating correspondence finding and final optimization independently, doing this one together gets us already from 67 to 54. And the reason is basically, well, the solver now uh, knows, or it, it doesn't consider every correspondence independently, but it rather considers the final alignment problem. Um, but now what's more interesting is this Psi here is now the correspondence selection with the correspondence weight that I just described. Um, so the, the solver or the network can assign low or high weight respectively. <coughs> what's interesting is if we, we have some supervised data from the data set here, and if you're doing that, we're going from 54 here to 36, so it's quite a massive improvement. Um, and this is really cool. Basically, if you visualize that, um, you're just getting rid of most of the outliers because the network learns what are, what are bad versus good correspondences. Um, of course, there's a sweet spot, right? If it gets rid of all of them, then it wouldn't get a good alignment anymore afterwards. But this balance in how many correspondences versus you want to make really sure about one correspondence, about this robustness, um, this is kind of automatically learned here. But what's even more uh, uh, exciting here is that the self-supervised version works even better so we don't need any annotations. We just run this model end to end and let the network figure it out um, based on the final reconstruction loss. So that is, I think, is a really cool thing because um, that means that we don't have to deal with complicated, robust optimization problems in this case anymore, but we rather run the network end to end and the network makes the selection of the correspondence completely without any annotation, uh, without any supervision on the weighting here. It selects which correspondences are how important. Um, and this one gives us, like, if you compare it to the baseline here of 67, right, to 31, is quite a massive improvement. Um, we also compare directly uh, against the baseline method. So here we have dynamic fusion, volume deform, and deep deform. Deep deform was the previous paper we had. Um, we have to be very careful now um, to put these numbers into context. Um, the main problem here, so of course we're better than dynamic fusion, we're better than volume deform um, by quite a margin here, actually. Um, for deep deform, we're only a little bit better, um, but this one has to be very carefully considered what the differences are. For deep deform, we need to run a network now for every correspondence, and we have this nice soft mag loss that tells us which of the target pixels is the most likely target for this one correspondence. So it's extremely costly to run because we need to run this network in deep deform for every correspondence. Whereas here, we have a single one-shot predictor um, that needs only a single forward pass and is trained end-to-end, um, so it gives us better numbers here and here. They're not so much better. They are better though, um, but they're 85, uh, 85 times faster, right? Because we don't need to run this network 100 times. We only have one network instead of like 100 or, so, or 85 or whatever, right? Um, so we qualitatively be also better than deep deform. Um, so this is an example, which is a pretty hard one because there's not so many correspondences on this t-shirt. Well, it's not so many features on this feature uh, on this t-shirt. Um, so for this sequence here, we are quite better. Um, we're also quite better than most of the other baselines here. Um, yeah, of course, this is our, our obligation um, here to do that. Um, but I wanted to quickly summarize the high-level ideas here. And this is, I think, um, pretty exciting to me. Um, so here we have, I've presented like three papers, right? Um, two of the CDPR papers, um, the deep deform. If you want to look at some data, look that one up. Um, we can learn the optimization process itself, but now we can also learn 
with the node tracking, we can also learn how to select correspondences. So I think it's a really cool research area. Um, at the moment, we are looking mostly at knowledge tracking, and we're not looking at the full reconstruction. Um, I think it would be really cool if we had like a loss that tells us good reconstruction, bad reconstruction, like an again discriminator style framework. Um, this could be cool, right? Um, basically learning that. Uh, what I'm very interested in is learning the optimization priors. So think about, um, yeah, you have a, an optimization problem, right? If I know my local minima, uh, I can run an optimizer. So all I have to know is how do we find the right local minima? So it's not like a softmax because I don't know how many how many local minima I have. Um, but if I can differentiate maybe through my optimization, um, this could possibly be quite cool. So here, for instance, right, if you have like an, uh, an energy landscape, um, here I know that this is a bad alignment, so I know that a lot of these local minima are bad. If I get this discriminator, for instance, that tells me it's bad, I could probably get good proposals um, that tell me, um, yeah, how to do the alignment a little bit better. Um, yeah, so this is basically the end of the talk. Um, I would like to thank all of the collaborators here. Um, I should also say that um, yeah, Aliash, uh, Pablo, and Young, these are the guys who did, the, who did actually all the work in terms of implementation. Um, I also took their slides. Um, if you have any further questions, uh, feel free to reach out to these ones um, directly. Uh, I'm sure they have a lot of insights, probably more than I do. Um, and I hope you still have a great ECC. So thanks a lot for the attention.